All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this fourth of six webinars that we are featuring throughout the year here at the National Museum of the Pacific War and paying tribute to the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. I'm Jeff Copsetta, and today we are joined by Mr. James D. Hornfisher, one of the top naval historians today and an award-winning author. Later in the program, we will also be joined by three archivists. We have Ms. Laura Weyers from the Naval History and Heritage Command. We have Mr. John Lyles from the Marine Corps Museum. And we have Mr. Chris McDougall from right here at the National Museum of the Pacific War. Now today's topic, the fleet at flood tide, revelation and reckoning in the Pacific War's end game. And we're gonna start with you, Mr. Hornfisher, if you could please, sir, take it away. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be uh, greeting our audience online today at the time of COVID. I'm situated here in the deep Texas hill country, uh, hometown of young Admiral Chester W. Nimitz. And uh, 30 minutes north of me is the beautiful imperialist National Museum of the Pacific War, where, which has been so kind to me over the years. It's been a great uh, venue to discuss this history. It's been a great place to uh, assemble with other scholars for symposia and special events. And of course, the museum itself is world class, on par with anything you'll find anywhere else. Anybody watching today with the opportunity to come to Texas, whether you're visiting Austin or San Antonio, it's a short hop out here to see one of the great uh, um, monuments to the achievements of the US during World War II in the Pacific. It's just a, a beautiful museum, ma masterfully done, well curated, and I highly recommend it to everybody watching. So thanks for being here. And again, thanks to the Nimitz folks. I understand we're also well, um, joined by uh, uh, the communities around the, uh, National, the Naval History and Heritage Command, as well as Marine Corps University, which have also been uh, great supporters of, and uh, facilitators of my work over the years as archi archivists and uh, repositories of knowledge, and also as venues for, for wonderful events commemorating and to remember this history. The history we're talking about today, of course, is the Great Central Pacific Campaign, the monumental achievement of the US Navy in World War II. Um, the fleet at flood tide focuses on Operation Forager, which was the capture of the Marianas Islands in June and July of 1944. This was a monumentally important campaign uh, that put our aircraft within the range of, of, of the home islands of Japan and which put us uh, in a position to dominate the Western Pacific with further operations uh, focused on the Philippines and uh, targets such as Iwo Jima and Okinawa. A revelation and a reckoning, the title of my talk gets at something though. Something very monumentally important happened in the Marianas, aside from the battles for Saipan, Tinian, and Guam. What America received there was an education in the nature of the Japanese as, an, as a war opponent. It was the first time we saw civilians on the battlefield. And if we push through the slides, we'll eventually get some portrayals of this, uh, of the horror that awaited our fighting men there. But it was a revelation uh, how the Japanese would conduct themselves on the field of battle, Japanese civilians, that is. And the reckoning reverberated at the, at the highest levels and had had an effect of galvanizing U.S. policy toward waging total war, which would be expressed from the Marianas in the form of uh, terrible uh, bomber raids against the home islands and a remorseless um, campaign of blockade and bombardment as well. So uh, it kicks off in June of 44. And the story is driven by the three individuals you see here. Raymond Spruance, the uh, commander of the Fifth Fleet, Kelly Turner, Spruance is uh, amphibious boss, commander of the uh, Pacific Amphibious Forces. And then Paul Tibbetts, commander of a very novel unit, the 509th Composite Group, which will be charged with a unique mission of dropping the atomic bombs on Japan. Highly secretive and classified operations staged from the island of Tinian beginning in September of 1944. Um, the Fleet of Flood Tide is uh, the title of my book. And when, when, I, when you hear that title, you may think of battleships and aircraft carriers. But this, this chart shows you naval production by type from 42 to 44, and the numbers that you jump out to you are highlighted. Landing craft, look at those numbers, 9,000 of those little bad boys. Um, Admiral King, the Chief of Naval Operations, remarked that the outstanding achievement of the war was the Navy's evolution of this capacity for heavy lift. So in the Marianas, for the first time, we were taking more than one division 
over a thousand miles of open ocean to assault a very heavily defended objective, the island of Saipan. Next slide, please. Um, Saipan is a, uh, a sort of a, uh, a commercial center for the Japanese. This is the staging area in Majuro in, in May of 1944. The sailors, you see the carriers of the Fifth Fleet uh, standing by at anchor. Well, the sailors get in some R&R preparatory to the uh, landings in June. Saipan will be a terrible objective for the Marines of the 4th and 2nd Divisions, uh, the, as well as the Army's 27th Infantry Division. Saipan is defended by a large Japanese garrison of 30,000 soldiers. It's also got uh, 30,000 Japanese civilians on it. It's also a very large island with, with very difficult terrain, coral, uh, coral and basaltic lava caves, craggy caves and jungle and, uh, and uh, in deep, deep, deep uh, jungle. And so they'll have to hack through this uh, in conditions that allow the, the uh, Japanese to hide and stage ambushes. Um, it's just a horrendous, uh, a horrendous experience for the Marines. And there are uh, the accounts that are available at the, at the at Marine Corps University really allowed me to delve into the human experience of this campaign. You see uh, there's a bit of city fighting in the Garapan, the, the small uh, provincial capital there on Saipan had to be taken. Um, and uh, so the, the importance of Saipan, of course, is its location south, basically due south of Tokyo. Saipan, Tinan, and Guam were 600 miles due south of Tokyo. And the, uh, uh, the convergence of interest that leads us to take these islands and prioritize them in the summer of 44 has to do with the, 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 the convergence of ambitions of both the Navy and the Army Air Forces. Uh, there's much talk of the, uh, of the parallel campaigns conducted by MacArthur and Nimitz. These, uh, this sort of uh, divided command setup that was very unwieldy and uh, confusing. But what, what clarified the vector through the Central Pacific and what ultimately persuaded uh, Franklin Roosevelt to authorize it was the fact that the Army Air Forces needed bases from which to bomb Japan. The plan originally was to uh, use bases in China to stage the B-29 bomb groups to hit the home islands, but uh, those bases were not secure from, from uh, overland attack. So the Japanese Kwantung Army uh, basically drove the bombers from the Asian mainland in China. And as a result, uh, the Army Air Forces decided upon the idea of taking the Marianas and turning them into a massive airdrome, which is precisely what happens after the, after the fall of these islands. Next slide, please. So the uh, troops go ashore on June uh, 15th, 1944. And the Japanese realize the threat immediately. The, the, the Marianas are critically important and they Choose, choose this moment, Admiral Azawa, the Japanese uh, combined fleet commander, Yama, Yama, uh, the Japanese high command uh, stages um, a massive deployment of its carrier forces to oppose the landings. And this precipitates the Battle of the Philippine Sea, which uh, is the air battles surrounding it are known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. Uh, it's a massive naval air battle pitting uh, nine Japanese carriers against 15 American Compare that to the Battle of Midway, which basically featured four against three, uh, and you get a sense of the scale of this thing. By the end of it, 380 Japanese planes are claimed shot down by American Hellcat pilots. And of course, the Japanese attacks against Task Force 38 are repelled by heavy anti-aircraft fire and were, uh, were buffed rather thoroughly. The evolution of American naval aviation is now complete. The carriers are no longer a hit and run force. Carriers used to have to hit and run, fearing constant counterattack by you know, better supported uh, land-based aircraft. Well, when you can send nine aircraft carriers against an objective, uh, you realize that you can hit and stay. You have enough strength to throw up a, a, a combat air patrol guided by a radar fighter direction, and you have enough of a counter of a striking force to reach out and touch somebody when they show up to fight you. So the uh, Hellcats and Avengers of Task Force uh, 58 are more than capable of sinking everything Admiral Azawa brings to the Marianas. And of course, the, we don't quite pull off that feat, but we do put down a couple of Japanese carriers. One of the controversies of the campaign is that Admiral Spruance understood his mission. The, the carrier aviators wanted to chase the Japanese fleet to the ends of the earth. Spruance knew his mission was to stand by Saipan, Tin, and Guam and support the amphibious forces to keep the Japanese from getting at Kelly Turner's forces ashore and sinking his transport shipping. And so Spruance stood by faithfully and did just that. He repulsed 
the, Jap the Japanese carrier attack, but was not lured to the west, was not lured into a position where he could have been flanked. And so this, this was galling to the pilots and to the, uh, the aviation admirals of Task Force 58, notably John Towers and Mark Misher. But people had to respect Spruance's judgment, his discretion, and he received his highest compliment from his opponent, Admiral Ozawa, who basically told uh, U.S. historians after the war that he found Spruance impossible to trap. You know, the Japanese used deception at all turns, and later, famously, late to Gulf, Admiral Halsey would fall into a Japanese trap, uh, leaving MacArthur's invasion beach at some peril. Spruance was immune to the charms of the decoy force. He knew he had to stand by and stay close to his objective, that his mission, and the mission of cover and support meant just that, you cover and support your, uh, the landing force at the objective. And so Spruance's conduct at uh, Philippine Sea was probably just the performance that Halsey ship turned in a few months later in the Philippines when we came so close to disaster. Well, indeed, it was sort of a disaster for the men of uh, Task Unit 77.4.3. The battles of Samar ensued because of Halsey's uh, inability to uh, resist a Japanese decoy. So uh, this, is, this is a theme of the battle as well. Let's go to the next slide and we'll see. Well, this slide here shows uh, the previous slide, please. Let's go back to that one. So, as the Japanese garrison is being pushed inland and north on Saipan, they retreat towards the northern end of the island. Marpy Point Cliffs um, are the uh, geographical feature up here. And as the Marines uh, push the Japanese into this uh, dead end, they're horrified to find them leaping to their deaths. The, the civilians with them, the Japanese soldiers are committing suicide. They're encouraging civilians to do the same. And indeed, women and children are leaping to their deaths from the northern promontory to these cliffs uh, at Marpy Point. Uh, translators are brought forward with bullhorns to beg them not to, not to leap, but to accept medical care and, and, and surrender to the American forces. But they're killing themselves. They've been brainwashed into thinking that the Americans are barbarians and will kill them and torture them. And so um, we're, we're trying to pull them out of caves, trying to get them to surrender. The Japanese are insisting on taking their lives. This was a horrible education. And this, uh, this news of Saipan traveled quickly to the highest echelons of, of American military command. The previous slide, if we jump back one, please, shows uh, uh, Holland Smith, the, the Marine Corps commander on Saipan, Chester Nimitz in the foreground, as well as Admiral King in the passenger seat, touring Saipan with a picked squad of Marine riflemen. This is not yet secure territory they're in. Um, this is a combat zone, but they see, they see what's happened at Marpy Point. They see these Japanese women and children's bodies floating in the surf. They hear reports from the Marines who have been trying to coax the Japanese to surrender uh, in vain. And the word travels back to uh, the Octagon Conference where President Roosevelt, Churchill, and the Combined Chiefs of Staff are gathering to discuss war strategy. Let's go to the next slide. And you see, uh, uh, first of all, we have... Uh, FDR to MacArthur, praising his work. We've been doing a really magnificent job against what were great difficulties given us by climate and by certain human animals. This is coming from President Roosevelt. This is followed up by the Allied Press Communique from Quebec City following the Octagon Conference. In a very short space of time, they reached decisions on all points, both with regard to the completion of the war in Europe now in its final stages and the destruction of the barbarians of the Pacific. Herm human animals, barbarians of the Pacific. We have a view of the Japanese that's turning very dark and, 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 uh, and very uh, subhuman. And this language in the top levels of government is activating. It's activating to a certain remorselessness in the part of the war effort bombarding Japan from the, from the Marianas with B-29s. The, uh, the effort to bomb the whole island with uh, high altitude precision strikes is foiled by the heavy winds and Curtis LeMay's innovation is to send in the B-29s at low altitude, 6,000 feet with uh, incendiaries and we proceed to burn out every Japanese city we can, we can send bombers over. Nagoya, Yokohama, Tokyo. And the horrifying thing beyond the loss of life is that these raids seem to have no appreciable effect on Japanese morale. There's no effect on the willingness of the Japanese high command to entertain surrender. At no point do they entertain surrender. The, 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 the uh, Japanese War Council, the so-called Big Six, are absolute bitter enders. They're determined to fight to the end, and it's the view of uh, 
men such as General um, Anami and Umezu that the Japanese people should all die as a penalty for their failure in war. And that, uh, and, that, and that even in spite of the long odds facing them, that there may be yet a chance to win a decisive battle, be it on Okinawa, which begins in April of 45, or then perhaps in the home islands themselves, if they can lure the Americans to land, they can unleash a kamikaze attack that will destroy our transport shipping uh, before it can land. And then uh, mobilize uh, Ketsugo, which is a massive effort to rally the, J the Japanese civilian populace, as well as home-based garrisons uh, in defense of the home islands. And so, uh, as General MacArthur and his staff in the Philippines are making intelligence assessments of what they can expect uh, with the landings in Operation uh, Olympic, the invasion of Kyushu, which is set for November of 1945, the estimates of the Japanese order of battle become, continue to rise. And they, it really becomes horrifying to MacArthur and his staff what they're going to face. Uh, meanwhile, here we have a shot of the, the transformation of Tinian and Guam into the largest strategic bombing airdrome in the world. It's the largest airdrome, B-29s, the 313th group, uh, you know, conventional units, as well as Tibbetts' secretive 509th composite group, which comes over in uh, September of 44 and sets up in a secret encampment in the northwest corner of Tinian, are preparing to unleash uh, an unprecedented uh, strategic campaign of bombing incendiaries and eventually nuclear weapons which will, in fact, be necessary to the ending of the war. Let's go to the next slide. So here is a, a shot of the uh, incendiary devices falling on, uh, I'm not sure what city this is, uh, perhaps Tokyo or Yokohama. Um, and here is the Japanese War Council reckoning with uh, their faltering prospects. The, to the, uh, um, the government is, uh, loses the, their prime minister after the fall of the Marianas. The writing is on the wall. Rational minds know it's over. But these men, as I say, are bitter enders. They believe that Japan should burn for its failure in war, and they're not above seeing decisive battle waged on their home territory. And so, here's General Anami, the worst of the, uh, these culprits, who simply refuses, you know, I mean, what, what, what an abject failure of a military commander to recognize when he's beaten. Um, it is not the privilege of the victor to decide when the vanquished surrenders. The vanquished has the privilege of deciding when to quit. And so Hitler has the wisdom to uh, quit in May of 1945. We just celebrated that 75th anniversary five days ago. What's often forgotten, if we'll jump back one slide, is the political pressure. Uh, I think it's maybe back one more, please. Oh, shoot. There's a newspaper headline somewhere in here which uh, talks about VE Day and the mobil mobilization plan for the uh, invasion of Japan actually suffers. Now, this is counterintuitive. Um, when Hitler throws in the towel, on one hand, all of our forces assigned to Europe are now free to be turned loose against Japan. This includes the entirety of the Eighth Air Force in England. It includes every, every division Patton has. Um, they're free to go to the Pacific and line up to invade Japan, except the political pressure on Harry Truman mounts to a, a very high level following Hitler's surrender. America's mothers say, bring my boys, bring my boy home. He landed at Anzio, he fought in North Africa, he fought in Italy, he fought in Southern Germany. Enough is enough, bring him home. And so what they do is they set up a point system. General Marshall shown here, sets up a point system. So experienced soldiers um, can accumulate enough points to receive a discharge. What happens is our divisions and our air units are bled of their most important uh, and, and valuable uh, veteran solar, soldiers and airmen. And uh, MacArthur is left with forces that are, you know, bled of experience from discharge. And so, uh, you know, he really is facing worse and worse estimates of, of enemy opposition. At the same time, his own units are of dubious value. Uh, what are we going to conquer Japan with? Well, Fortunately, we're not going to have to because, first of all, the, our scientists at Los Alamos have devised a uh, weapon known as the Little Boy, as well as the Fat Man, two, two devices that will unleash nuclear fission, several kilotons worth of explosive power. And on August 6, 1945, Paul Tibbetts makes his famous flight in the Enola Gay over Hiroshima, 
destroys the city with a little boy bomb, and then three days later, uh, Nagasaki follows. And uh, Emperor Hirohito receives the uh, cover for his pride that he needs to overrule his suicide-minded uh, war council, basically. And in a tearful oration before them, he explains that the Americans are employing this cruel new weapon and that the Japanese, for the, the good of humanity, um, owe it to the world to stop fighting. And this is the radio broadcast he sends out on August 15th, the Imperial Rescript. And it activates a stunning reversal on the part of the Japanese people. They go from a total war posture, you know, um, to as the Americans come in to occupy Japan following uh, the, the armistice. Um, it's almost a complete uh, change in temperament. They are obsequious, they are friendly, they are welcoming, they're courteous. And the occupation of Japan, the, the, the plan to invade Japan, Operation Olympic and Cornet become, go from a mission of conquest to a mission of mercy. Uh, Operation Magic Carpet, first of all, brings home American soldiers from the Pacific, uh, and also delivers Japanese soldiers home from their garrisons. And so all of our LSTs are used for these humanitarian purposes. And uh, you see here, uh, well, uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, here it is, Magic Carpet, um, bring home the fighting forces, which never, you know, we never had to reckon with the Japanese army in any major way, except for possibly in the Philippines, but we brought them home. And then, uh, and the fact that they were able to surrender was wrenching to Japanese pride, uh, but it enabled them to, uh, to throw in the towel. And so on one level, you know, you look at the, at the death count mounting in the late war, and the, uh, on, one, on one hand, you can say the bombing of, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were an act of mercy that shocked a absolutely insane uh, war leadership back to its senses and saved its own people from famine and uh, starvation and disease. It also saved the people on, uh, in China, you know, dying at, the, at a rate of 20,000 a day by some estimates. So everything, anything we could do to end this war with a shock was, a, was an act of mercy and an act of, uh, an act of uh, well, mercy and kindness, ultimately. And so, you know, it's a horrendous way to end a war, targeting civilian populations with atomic weapons. But the effect of it was to end the war, and just on the level of human life, savings in human life, I think you can say it was, uh, it was a moral act. So this is the story I wanted to tell uh, about the strategic centrality, really, of the, of the Operation Forager conquest in the Marianas um, Islands, because they were so important to the manner in which the war was ended. Uh, you can't say the same thing about Iwo Jima or Okinawa. The Marianas were the, really the most strategically important operation of the entire Pacific War. And I want to do justice to what was done and what, uh, what arose from those uh, momentous combat operations. So um, I guess we're probably running low on time here, and I think I'll wrap. But uh, thank you for your interest and attention, and perhaps we'll have some time for some questions. Before we get to the uh, questions, and, and anybody can feel free to go ahead and use the chat feature uh, to type in your questions. We will get to them after we speak with some of the uh, archivists that are joining us. And the first archivist we want to speak to is uh, Miss Laura Wears. Again, she is from the Naval History and Heritage Command. So uh, thanks for joining us, Laura, uh, and welcome. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> Um, so I've had the pleasure of working with uh, Mr. Hornfisher on his uh, research, and um, one of the collections he used was the papers of Admiral Nimitz, which we have in our collections. Um, it's a fairly large collection, about 68 cubic feet, um, and uh, kind of one of the more special things we have um, from his papers. Barbara, if you want to put that on the screen. Um, we have a, a deck plan of the USS Missouri from the surrender ceremony uh, in Tokyo Bay. There it is. Um, so you can see it's got his um, handwritten notations on it. Um, in the middle, he drew the table with the initials CWN, which is Chester W. Nimitz, um, and kind of drew out where everybody was standing. Um, so it's just really a really special document. Um, and then up in the corner, I'll read what he wrote because it's kind of difficult to read. Um, <clears throat> he wrote, every turret top, every point of vantage was occupied by newsmen, cameramen, including the Jap papers, 
and officers and men of a ship who could get a foothold. When it came my turn to sign, I'll confess to nervous excitement, but I did sign in the correct places. One signer did not. First copy signed with blue gift pen and a second copy signed with my old green Parker pen. Um, and then on the back of it, he uh, wrote a letter to his wife um, just afterwards and uh, described the scene. Um, and um, Mrs. Nimitz also, you know, recognized the significance of this document and she put it in a safe deposit box. Um, and eventually I think um, her daughter must have found it and sent it to us in the 1980s. Um, this document was not uh, donated with the rest of his papers, but uh, kind of came in a little bit later. So um, that's one of the gems that we have in our collections. Um, Jeff, I'll throw it back to you. I'm thinking this where is that is really something interesting to see as a really unique uh, artifact. Thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, now we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Mr. John Lyles from the uh, Marine Corps Museum. And uh, sir, what, what do you have to share with us today? Um, again, I, I have, uh, I have uh, the, the John Chapin uh, collection. Um, it's always great to see sort of the end product of, of, of the materials that get used. We see the historians come in, such as Mr. Hornfisher, um, but it's always great to see how they use the, the materials that they access. Um, the Chapin collection is, is a fairly small collection. Um, it's, it's only consists of about four items, um, but the, the major part of the, the collection is a 127 page memoir that Chapman uh, wrote um, I want to say about 1980. Um, we don't have a definitive date on it, but it's a, a personal recollection of his time in the Marine Corps. Of course, he enlisted in 1942. He goes through OCS at Quantico, and uh, in December of 42, he is uh, a second lieutenant. Um, from there, he documents his training all the way through uh, the two engagements that he was involved in at uh, Quangelin and at Saipan. Um, but the, the beauty of, of the memoir is it's a very personal account of his activities and sort of experiences. Um, it is a lieutenant's view of um, war. Um, and, and it's very granular and it's very focused in that way. And I, I think it's very compelling in that way as, as well as um, what he's essentially laying bare is, is how he experienced war. And, and, you know, that's fascinating as we see this, this big war machine um, turning, um, but it's composed of individuals and those individuals bring a different perspective. And his perspective is, again, sort of at the, but the, the, it's not even at the battalion level, really. It's at the company and sort of platoon level. And that's, that's a fascinating juxtaposition against sort of the higher level, um, accounts that you get so um so yeah that that's pretty much the chapman collection and, and that's you know one of the hundreds if not thousands of sort of personal memoirs that we have um from from individual marines that that give their accounting of of their experiences and 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 like i said it's it's fascinating to see sort of the end product and how historians actually use these items and, and weave them into their narrative and 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 they they bring a different perspective um and and you know bring it back home that you know these are individuals that are sacrificing um for, for their nation and you know it it it's a it's again it's just a different perspective so um the Jan john chatton uh, collection was was uh one that uh, again it, it spoke very very clearly um from a lieutenant's perspective. Uh, that, that's interesting, Mr. Laws. Yeah, like we mentioned uh, when we were speaking briefly yesterday, you know, to really get that micro picture really makes a collection like that very unique as far as from a, you know, the, the bigger perspective macro picture, it doesn't really change. Our facts don't really change so much, but once you really dive into an individual soldier Marine's perspective, uh, it really opens it up. Uh, and Mr. Hornfisher, please feel free if you have any, any comments to, to add in here as well. Oh, yeah, John Chapin's um, memoir, I think I said it about eight or ten times in the book. It's, it's a wonderful uh, perspective. Uh, going back to the Nimitz material, I want to mention also the Nimitz Gray book is a great resource for anybody interested in the uh, operational level of command. Um, it's a, literally a record of every dispatch that Nimitz's headquarters received or sent in chronological order 
we are in five or six volumes, Laura. How many volumes is it? Six, five? I mean, it's absolutely authoritative. It's a, and it gives you a sense of the complexity of the operations that SyncPAC fleet had to manage. Nimitz and staff, you know, directed all these diverse operations ranging across the entire um, Pacific. And the gray book shows the complexity of managing as a four star, you know, uh, theater commander. Uh, it shows command relationships. It shows uh, trade offs, decisions, operational planning at every level. And so the Nimitz gray book, which I, it may be online now even. Yes, it is online. Is um, yeah. 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 Yes. Completely, completely digitized and online, yeah. Anybody who's interested in the Pacific War should consult the Nimitz gray book as a, a primary source. Uh, it's worth reading just, just, just to appreciate what Nimitz had to do every day and the staff, the complexity of the operations, the, uh, uh, on every level. And uh, so it's just an, an inestimably valuable source. Um, and then uh, these oral histories at Marine Corps University, much like at U.S. Naval Institute or uh, any other repository that maintains a high level of, uh, you know, high level of craft and discipline of uh, oral history. These records are immensely important and valuable to writers because they take you inside the experience at that personal level. And I use them uh, at every turn in all of my work, wherever I can find them. So thank you for all that you do. Absolutely. And on the uh, topic of memoirs, we're going to go ahead and turn it over now to uh, Mr. Chris McDougall, our archivist here at the National Museum of the Pacific War. And I believe he has a uh, memoir that he wants to speak about as well. Thank you, Jeff. Um, yes, I do. I've, I've got a memoir here that um, uh, Mr. Hornfisher used in, in the book that we're uh, all speaking about. Um, it's called um, The Promise Aloft by uh, Charles Freer. Um, Mr. Freer was a uh, pilot with uh, BC-65 on USS Midway, and he took part in the uh, Marianas Turkey shoot and a uh, small segment of his book um, is included in uh, Mr. Horn Fisher's book. Um, one of the uh, greatest collections of material that we have here uh, is our oral history uh, collection. Um, and along with that, we also have um, approximately 2000 uh, unpublished memoirs of various kinds, various lengths. Um, between the two resources, they're very rich uh, and material for uh, historians. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, document, documentary makers and uh, historians both uh, reach out to us and use quite a few of our um, resources. Um, that's primarily what I wanted to share and uh, great collections. Along the way you picked up the uh, landing, the, LS, the LST Sailors Association records also, didn't you? Yes. That was for the recent acquisition. I drew on that uh, for Fleet of Flood Tide as well. The uh, those old LST sailors never get the credit they deserve. They deserve. Absolutely. So uh, for right now, as our uh, we are starting to get some questions in, but uh, for our panelists here, if you guys, if there was uh, any comments that you wanted to make with each other, we're going to put you all on the screen here. And if there's any other uh, discussion you would like to make. Uh, with each other. We, we've got a little bit of time to do that before we get to some of these uh, questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Uh, you know, my, my main question for uh, Mr. Hornfisher is uh, sort of how do you balance the individual's perspective with the much larger um, view of, of, of uh, w when you're writing your, your, your manuscripts? Because um, I find the individual perspectives for me is more fascinating, but you know, there, there's gotta be that balance. And so how, how did you come by that? And I try to project my sympathetic imagination into the situation. I feel like until I can see and feel the way something might've been, I'm not well prepared to write about it. Cause I'm trying to write in, in a sort of immersive narrative style. And so the sources such as you collect enable me to project my sympathetic imagination into uh, somebody's, you know, somebody's situation, whether it's they're, they're on an ant tank on the beach of Saipan under mortar fire. I want to know what things felt like. I want to know what happened. I want to know why they happened. And I also want to know why they mattered. 
so if I can show the reader what happened, what it felt like, um, why it happened and why it mattered, I think that's a satisfying story construct. And so, so it, it has to do with texture, visual, and to me I'm very visual when I'm reading a memoir. If I'm reading about John Chapin moving inland into the, into the scrub of Saipan, I want to know what things looked and felt like to him. And he was a very gifted, very gifted at expressing that, sure. as, as were other Marines in the 2nd and 4th Division whose um, accounts are in your collection. A number of them were uh, our side in the flood tide. Um, so, you know, these sources allow me to, uh, you know, I've never served a uniform, I've never been in combat, never been shot at, but through these sources, you can begin to understand what it looked and felt like. And then once I have that uh, sense, I feel like I'm in a position to bring the reader along. So that's my, that's more or less my process is understanding with my own five senses what something must have felt like or looked like or been like, and then bring the reader along using words as kind of a palette, you know. It's great fun, it really is. Uh, so for the panelists here, uh, how can folks uh, contact you to help with any kind of research that they're doing? Um, so for the Navy, um, you can, we have tons of resources on our website. Um, it's history.navy.mil. Um, so I suggest go there first, take a look. Um, if you don't find what you need, um, you can send us an email at archives at navy.mil. Yes, uh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say for the museum here, um, people can reach out to us via email or phone. Um, the contact information is there on our website. Uh, we have a small fraction of um, our material online, but we do have an online repository. Um, about half of our oral histories are online, so uh, people should check that out. Sure. Um, the best way to contact the Marine Corps Archives is, is through our email, and that's going to be history.division at usmcu.edu. Um, we have an online presence, and we're, we're currently trying to migrate uh, more resources online, but that's, again, that's a work in progress. Um, but yeah, the email works great, um, and uh, that, that, that's pretty much the best, best way to go about it. Excellent. Thank you all. So this first question we have for you is for all the panelists here. Uh, do you think revisionist historians will eventually change our interpretation of the moral use of the atomic bomb? Or is this already being taught in college? I think revisionism had its heyday, uh, probably peaking or back around 95 with the Enola Gay exhibit. We had uh, books come out like uh, The Decision to Drop the Atomic Bomb by Gar Alperovitz, which uh, was a, a political document basically. Not so much a work on history. He ignored uh, all the relevant Japanese source materials but what the Japanese were thinking and doing. Uh, you cannot ignore that material and call your book history, I'm sorry. So, so these books have had their heyday, I think, and I think they've been thoroughly debunked by the works of uh, Richard Frank, uh, Dennis Gian Greco, uh, Downfall by Richard B. Frank, which is probably the best book on the, on the end game of the Pacific War, including the decision to drop the atomic bombs. And it thoroughly debunks the idea that, that, uh, you know, that we had all kinds of other choices. Uh, the Pacific commanders were determined to end the war as soon as possible for the lowest level of loss of life on, on, on the part of all sides. And we wanted very much the Russians to come in. Admiral Nimitz you know, was explicit about this, as was General Marshall, eager to see the Russians come into the war to end it, help, help end it on as fast a timetable as possible. And so these fantastic notions that there were all these parlays underway, that the Japanese were beaten and we knew they were like days away from surrendering and we dropped the bombs anyway. I feel, like the, 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 I feel like these notions have been thoroughly debunked thanks to the work of Richard Frank and J Dennis Jean Greco, which I uh, drew upon in my own work, um, convincing, uh, I think very convincing on the question of the necessity of, of the atomic bombs. Now, you know, it's nasty business. Some people will recoil morally no matter what you say about that decision because dropping a bomb like that on a population center is a ghastly, ghastly thing. But as I said earlier, you know, it's not the privilege of the conqueror to tell the conquered when to surrender. Only the defeated can summon the courage to decide when it's over. And this is something the Japanese steadfastly 
refused to do until it was forced upon them through sheer force of arms. And so I think, you know, I, th I don't know uh, what the future of revisionism holds. I think it's probably taught in universities that uh, the atomic bombings were barbaric acts that were unnecessary on some level. But uh, anybody who reads into the, uh, the, these very good books will see that uh, this easy revisionism simply doesn't hold up any longer. Based on the documentary record of all the Japanese, all the Jap accounts of all the, the Japanese memoirs who testified to the paralysis of the so-called the Imperial uh, Big Six Supreme War Direction Council, the inability to do the right thing, to do the humane thing and quit when it could have saved lives. Very interesting. Uh, any of the other uh, panelists want to chime in on that one? <laughs> I'll take that as a no. I think Mr. Hornfisher uh, covered it great. Well, the next question is actually for uh, Mr. Lyle, sir. Uh, question from Miss Linda Harrison. Uh, she was interested in what division uh, that John Chapman was in or even what company. Her dad uh, served in the, the fourth division and in uh, headquarters John's company in both of the areas that were mentioned. Uh, he, he served with both, uh, I, well, interesting enough, Company K in both 324 and Company K in 325. Excellent. Okay. So uh, again, one more question for all the panelists here. Would you say that the experience with Japanese civilians at Saipan helped to inform the overall mindset of the Japanese as a whole and the decision to use the atomic bomb? I think it informed the uh, apprehension with which we approached uh, estimates of the order of battle and, and, and what the likely behavior would be on the part of Japanese civilians when confronted with American forces on Japanese territory. So it informed casualty estimates and informed, uh, you know, the confidence interval that MacArthur and, uh, you know, 6th and 8th Army had, perhaps projecting casualties, um, establishing timetables for basic objectives. If we knew that, that the Japanese civilians were going to fight, you know, and pick up arms and uh, they're going to be armed and have a willingness to fight to the end, it changed everything. We're talking about millions of potential combatants added to the Japanese order of battle. So that's really where it was important. Laura, John, Chris, any thoughts on that? Ditto for me. <laughs> Uh, so uh, this is for the archivist. Could you sh could you each uh, share one of the most interesting items in your collection? Uh, Ms. Wares, we'll start with you there. Uh, sure. Um, so the item that I showed earlier is um, definitely up there. It's one of my favorites. Um, another item I would say, um, so we also have the papers of Admiral Harold Stark. Um, he was commander of Naval Forces Europe during World War II, um, and he also um, uh, served in London uh, during World War I. So um, spent a lot of time in London, became friends with um, a lot of important people in London. So um, we have some correspondence between him and uh, the current Queen Elizabeth. So um, those are some pretty interesting letters. Mr. Laws? Yeah, for, for, for me, it would be, it's a diary, it's a unique diary. Uh, Eichmann was a member of the 4th Marines, uh, was captured at Corregidor, um, but while he was a POW, he wrote a diary, um, not a traditional diary, like I said, um, it was essentially, it's entitled, Let's Eat. Um, he wrote recipes. Um, I, I, I would imagine that that would be torture, but uh, it seems like it was a mind exercise for him, where he wrote down recipes, with the ingredients list and how to prepare different foods. And um, the rationale behind it, again, I believe it was a mind exercise, but uh, I also, part of me as a foodie hopes that that was sort of his wish list once he um, was, was released, that he, his plan was to make every meal um, that, that he documented. Um, but that, that, that's an interesting item, probably the most interesting that, that um, 
we have in our collection that uh, um, appeals to me on numerous levels. Again, it's a, a, a traumatic experience and it's interesting on the way that he chose to deal with uh, uh, being a prisoner of war. That is, that is very interesting. Uh, at, at the very beginning of your comment there, I think you cut out, we didn't quite catch the name of who, of who wrote that diary. Who was that again now? The, the, the title of the collection is Martin Eichmann. It's the Martin Eichmann collection. Okay, excellent. Okay, Mr. McDougall, off to you. What is, uh, what is your favorite item that we have here in the collection? Um, well, first of all, um, that uh, comment about the uh, diary and the, the recipes, that, that seems to be kind of a, a theme for, for POWs, um, at least in the, in the Pacific Theater. Um, we have quite a few diaries here in our collection and uh, quite a few of them, uh, there are a lot of recipes uh, throughout them. Uh, but uh, my favorite item um, has to do with the, uh, the surrender of the Japanese on uh, the Missouri. Uh, we have a uh, collection that came from a uh, sailor who was aboard Missouri at that time. And he made it um, his uh, hobby after the war to collect autographs uh, from all of the other people that were on Missouri. Um, after the war. Um, I don't think he was quite able to get one from everybody. But uh, he managed to get uh, an autograph and quite often a signed photo uh, from pretty much everybody that was there that day, oh. uh, including uh, all of the uh, individuals that signed the document. The surrender document. That is, incredible. that is really something. Uh, we have a question directed for you, Mr. Hornfisher. Uh, have you ever been asked to write or provide support to a movie or a miniseries like Band of Brothers about the Navy and the Pacific? Uh, most of oh, okay. movies focus on the air war or submarines and the surface ships seem to be forgotten. Yeah, no, I never have actually. Uh, all my books are available to be developed for film and if that ever were to happen, I'd be uh, hopefully close in, closely involved. Um, I hope that the appetite for good, you know, uh, World War II filmmaking uh, persists. The uh, Midway movie, I was excited to see. Uh, well, I know that uh, Woody Harrelson spent some time in Fredericksburg learning the habits of Chester Nimitz, and he gave a great performance. I think he reflected uh, Nimitz's attitude and reflexes quite well in his portrayal. And I was heartened to see the movie top in the box office for a couple of weeks. So hopefully that will encourage Hollywood to make more uh, World War II films based on good historical material. And uh, if that happens, I will be standing by to be involved. But no, I've not been involved as a film consultant. So uh, Mr. Wormfisher, uh, any hints to your next book? I'm working on, uh, after we read the Fleet of Floods had, we had Japan occupied and the bombs dropped and uh, Japan occupied. There was, for me, there's no going back to another campaign in World War II. So I'm moving on to the Cold War now. And uh, I'm, I'm doing a multi-volume naval history of the Cold War. So the first volume will carry from 45 to 1960. And uh, I'm hoping to be finished with it this year and have it out late 2021. Wow, excellent. Thank you for sharing with that. It looks like that's the uh, last question we have time for. Uh, Mr. Hornfish, I did want to uh, make a comment there. I think it was the, one of the first questions you answered, uh, your perspective of sympathetic imagination. I, I think that is really well put as a perspective when attacking uh, the topics that you do and you do so well. Uh, so again, I wanted to thank all of our panelists and of course, all of our attendees today who uh, got to log on and see this webinar. And as a reminder, our next webinar next month, we will be joined by John C. McManus, and he is going to talk about the topic, the Battle of Okinawa. So again, thank everyone for coming on to our webinar and thank helping you. us celebrate the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. We'll see you next time.